I'm Katie Hogan. I'm a total Chicagoan. I grew up on the south side, southwest side, and we're sitting here on the northeast side. So it's about 30 miles from the doorway of my restaurant to the doorway of my mother's house, and it's all city in between. And I not only taught about the city for 25 years, but I, I'm now studying the city. I find myself at age 50 in the year 2000 going back to get a master's degree in a subject that I've taught and lived all my life. So I had no idea that I'd be so rooted to Chicago when I was a young person going to college. I assumed I'd live somewhere else, you know, travel the world, and I have traveled. But I always come back to Chicago. And it's exciting to come back to Chicago, even from exciting places, which is where I like to go. But um, So I am pretty uh, steeped in this town. And the roots that we have sunk here on the corner of Lunt and Glenwood in Rogers Park um, are very important to me. Um, and and exist because of what what happened before in my life. Um, growing up on the southwest side in the 1950s, one of the first awarenesses I had outside of my seven brothers and sisters was the racism of my neighborhood. I mean, it was the 50s and early 60s, and you could almost, uh, you could go down 103rd Street and watch like like pioneers in covered wagons, white people heading west, saying, they're coming, they're coming. Um, it was appalling and it made a lifelong impact. I mean, I, I am here because I am an anti-racist. I am here in this corner in Rogers Park in the city of Chicago because I am an anti-racist. And I find no better place to really struggle with it than right here. What is an anti-racist? <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible way to define someone by a, a negative. I mean, I, I would not do that, generally. I'm pro everything. Um, but an anti-racist is a, the result of growing up in racism. An anti-racist is what happens when you have people who look like you, who you love, who claim to be what you are, which is, say, Irish Catholic, Irish Catholic Southside, who claim to be leaders, who claim to be Democrats, which is funny because right now the South Side Boys, the white guys, they call blacks Democrats. That's their little code word. Which I'm, I'm real slow to get caught up to the latest slang for it. But I am also a racist because I'm an American. And you're born on this soil as a white person, it runs in your veins. Um, we have to learn how to unlearn um, race-based prejudice and discrimination, all of us. So when I say I'm an anti-racist, I don't separate myself from the people who are really virulently and unapologetically, you know, that way. And I, I've learned a lot about uh, sort of going halfway towards everybody in this talk at this point because some of the more obnoxious people I've run across in the last decade are people who are so holier than thou about teaching anti-racism that, you know, they can't talk to anybody. <laughs> and I'm not sure that that uh, really, um, I don't think that that really uh, achieves anything. So, in my neighborhood right now, we have everybody. Everybody lives here, all colors, all strains, you know, the assumed, uh, assumed sane and the assumed insane, young and old, everything. And uh, I like my neighborhood that way. Uh, there is a tendency right now in the city, in the year 2000, to think that we could sort of blanket it middle class, what, no matter what color. And uh, that's one thing that yuppies are, uh, yuppies are accepting as long as you have, you know, a BMW and 400 grand to spend on a little piece of floor space. What is the yuppie? Well, that's unfair too. I know, I'm sorry. All these distinctions. I'm a yuppie probably, except I'm not young anymore in many people's eyes. Um, young urban professionals, right? Um, I, I spent 20 years teaching people who would become young urban professionals. 
but I, I was teaching them um, ways of conscience, you know, ways of of understanding you can do you can do well with by doing good, um, as opposed to um, having as your measuring stick of your life's worth um, your bank account or your stock portfolio. Um, and I do believe that my that experience confirmed for me that most people actually do want to do good um, and do well if they can. Um, and so I, I've learned that you know it's not fair to call people yuppies. And I know that when I've trooped my students through in various areas of this city over the years, I was assumed to be a yuppie because I would have to dress nice as a teacher and have my trench coat on. Can't hide the white skin thing. And the name Hogan, which, you know, everybody thinks I'm a teamster, corrupt person or something. I'm not. But um, but I do come from union family, not, not teamster. Oh, God. Don't ever print this. <laughs> um, so, yuppies, yuppies notwithstanding, we have a, uh, we have a s city going through a really wonderful sort of transformation in some ways. There's there's attention being paid to um, life that is coming out of the ground, as in trees, shrubs, bushes, flowers. Um, there there needs to be more attention to the other forms of life in our neighborhoods, um, and not just to throw people in jail. I mean, I, the the juvenile justice system is a place that right now that is extremely active and there are, I know because of studying it with my students, there are some really good people with good intentions um, trying to transform uh, the system and, the, and therefore the kids who go through the system. Um, but a lot of folks don't have any concept of how many young people are from, from birth systemized in, in our in a variety of ways, whether it's foster care, DCFS, all this sort of thing. And um, we, our city is wanting not to see that, wanting not to admit that's there, much less deal with it. And, and we have a lot of folks coming in, moving into the city, moving into the central city. Of course, it makes sense. They could walk to work or they can ride their bikes to work. Um, and that's great. I like the re-inhabiting of the city. I just want it to stay interesting, you know, not boring, not all the same. I, I do believe that economic um, variety in, a, in one neighborhood is possible because it is right here in Rogers Park. It's, there is still economic diversity in this neighborhood. And we don't have any um, high-rise housing projects at all. We have lots of, we have, uh, federally funded housing for the aged. We have federally funding housing for um, various uh, handicapped groups, whether that's uh, physically disabled or otherwise. Um, we have uh, group homes for young people and other aged people who are trying to transition into a more uh, self-run part of their lives. These are, these are like, to me, the most important experiments and works on the planet right now. Helping people get through what? I just want to address something here, but I don't know what you said. They're mixing bread. So, what did you just say something? I just want to see. I just, I just would like for this city to make room for all people of all races, of all income levels, of all ability levels, and that I know for sure each of us is bigger for however many different kinds of people we encounter as we walk out our door in the morning. I don't think it's healthy for folks to leave their house, enter a hallway, get in an elevator, go to a car without, going, without getting the sun on their face, go in their car to another building, in another elevator, and, you know, and never, never run across the arbitrary or the accidental. Um, that's not to me what a city should be. A city is um, unexpected things, unexpected and new people every day. And yeah, you can be anonymous, but 
let's not be afraid to share the same airspace. Because then we'd be inclined not to guard the same airspace. For example, this week, we have tons of snow. The kind of win winters that most of us older types grew up with in Chicago. And we haven't seen for a while, but good big snow early in the year, which means we're probably going to have a lot more of it. And what does the mayor say? <laughs> ah, the mayor says, hey, don't mess with anybody's dinette set out on the street. <laughs> It's illegal, Mayor. You've got the big pulpit up there. Why don't you say, hey, Chicago, get out there with your neighbors. If, if 10 people, if only 10 people on a block decide to go out with their shovels, they could have more than 10 parking spaces free and all the spaces in between, plus the sidewalks, in no time whatsoever, plus which, furthermore, Mr. Mayor, you could say, any block that managed to, to shovel itself out in the next week or so, I'll throw you a hot chocolate party supreme. You know, I mean, come on. What? I couldn't believe he said that. What a lack of leadership in that particular instance. And I don't, you know, I take it instance by instance, by the way. I am not slamming the guy full out down the hill forever. Two years ago, when we had a big snow, I remember this, he said, specifically on the news to young people, get out there and shovel your neighbor's walks. You know how much weight that carries? You know how significant that was? I thought it was great that he did that. I thought what he did a week ago was really off. And he has gotten a lot of feedback, I guess. I've, I have caught Eric Zorn and a few other people raking him over the coals for it. But you know the other thing in our society at large, and this isn't just our mayor, our society at large is really bad at giving and taking criticism, and um, it's a huge, it's a huge fault, failing. It's a, an incredible flaw because it takes so much energy for people to um, hold back, um, finding out what their faults are and their flaws are, hold and you know try and pretend like they aren't there. It takes so much more energy to do that than to say, "Oops, I'm sorry. Let's try again." <laughs> I mean, we have to do that in our private lives all the time. What is it about people getting on camera and getting a name that makes them think, we think, that they're flawless? We don't. So, so, so knowing what goodwill and what sort of leadership would come of making, having made such a move, why would he do otherwise other than the He novelty? must have been just having a bad day, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that, uh, I think he would, he would really win a lot of uh, goodwill as you put it, um, just by saying, you know, I think I made a mistake when I said that. What I'd really like to say, and, and actually invite others to speak for ourselves, invite communities up with their solutions to digging out of the snow. So in the sort of, in the city of Chicago where the mayor is such a powerful position, what are some... What are some other indirect ways in which you provide leadership that doesn't have to deal with the exact Power management? Structure. Yeah, but just ideas about the way you talk about the way the city should function, not in, certain, not in terms of individual departments, but ideas from a pulpit that says, this is the way we can learn to live together. And oh, there's endless. I mean, endless. He could have, I mean... For the president, it's the same, to talk... Absolutely. You know, to you know, talk about the common civility stuff that people run into every day. You get on the L. The L pulls up. It's crowded. People start jumping on the L before they've let people off. Now, I don't know. I'm old, so I was taught manners, you know, and that seems to be what has, you know, the gap. But if, if instead of these automated voices that say, doors open on the left, you know, on the L now, which is really, I miss the love train, you know what I mean? Um, if they said, if there was actually a human voice that said, please wait, let, you know, a human voice connected to a body, connected to a face with eyeballs that said, could you wait till people get off? Or, you know, th that in a non-judgmental way, people need to hear this stuff so that they don't get all bristly and defensive, but that um, people can help each other. And folks don't know 
folks have no idea how much how much they can help. Actually, once you talk to them, they do. They know that just literally walking down the street and smiling at folks and saying good morning makes a huge difference. So at this point in history, how does someone like the mayor or the new president-elect turn around and provide this sort of, what introduced this into a political discourse that says we need to think more about the way we deal with each other as individuals, whether you're talking about cities becoming more you know, rural in the sense of how people identify with each other more rural. and communicate, or I don't know, but beyond just policy ideas and decisions. Well, you know, they, they all have a little bit of an answer. You know, I mean, George W., well, I pray. <laughs> I really pray it's not all the things that I've heard he is, um, or, but I do think he has a folksy quality about him that would allow him to have his own version of sort of fireside chat concept. Not, not that, but which is the FDR thing. And, and Clinton did his radio show, but somehow I don't think the masses tuned in. But I think that if people in positions of power not only regularly opened up the camera and talked to people straight ahead, just, you know, instead of talking to the press sitting in front of them, saying, starting out by saying, Americans, <laughs> good morning, Americans. I know that today you're feeling, what, worried about the economy, a little scared about whether or not your um, next door neighbor is going to bring down your property value, but let me suggest a couple of ideas. You know, and really, literally, and I don't mean to sound like the Oprah show here for na the nation, but I, I actually do think she does fine work for the people who she affects. She really does good work. And I think that everybody can do that kind of good work. Richie Daly, um, <laughs> I don't even mind the fact that he's somewhat inarticulate. That, that actually reflects us in Chicago very well in some ways. But he is not, he is not stupid. He does know what a community needs to be a community. Um, he knows much more than he shares with the wide city. And in fact, you know, this system in Chicago is not supposed to be strong mayor. It's supposed to be weak mayor, strong council. I would really like to see the city council actually be elected leaders as opposed to elected um, connectors. You know, people connect with the developers over the people who live in their neighborhood. Um, people who connect with the movers and shakers as opposed to the people who live in their neighborhood. There's, there's, a, there's a selection process that happens, I think, once people get into politics in Chicago, whereby they stop talking to regular people, they just talk to each other. Um, and they try and do things to make themselves look good. And I've been involved in politics a long time, and there's very few people that I've seen who don't uh, sink themselves, just really fall into that pattern. Um, and one of them was Harold Washington, and one of them is David Orr. Um, and there's a smattering of a few more. There's a couple women in politics who have been, who are still pretty darn good. Um, Julie Hamus is one, and our, our, our congressperson, Jan Schakowsky, is, uh, is very good. But everyone, you know, there's an ego thing that is pretty hard to escape when people get into politics that I really think ineffectualizes them. And I'm not sure if there's any answer. I'm, I'm um, you know, people in the religious life, people who are ministering to their flock, for example, um, it seems like we've compartmentalized. So we get, we get certain kind of guidance from this part of our life, an hour on Sunday morning, we get, other guidance from the newspaper and these lists of numbers. We get another kind of guidance. Yes, I'd love some coffee. Um, we get another kind of guidance from uh, from political leaders, or or not, or you know. And I I think that uh, I think it's unhealthy actually for for folks to have political leadership that doesn't. Um, every once in a while, not always, but doesn't every once in a while just ignore the divisions and speak to the full quality of our lives. I mean, it is an individual, a human being, who is walking up the L, to the L, putting our little fare card in and riding it. We know we do have some concept of air quality. Why doesn't the city, 
I mean, we should be paying five bucks a gallon for gas. This is not a popular concept. I know. <laughs> I have siblings and other human beings in my life who don't understand where I'm coming from, but we should be. In England, they've been paying the equivalent of five bucks a gallon for 10 years or more. Our air quality in Chicago is maybe the third worst in the country. People don't know that. It's true. Check with a community organization like uh, CNT, uh, Center for Neighborhood Technology. They keep, they keep re records on this sort of thing. Or the um, Lake Michigan Federation on our water quality. Um, our mayor has, and our city council for sure, they're like, uh, they're know-nothings on the environment and what we're doing with it. They don't do, they have no concept and they don't provide leadership on it. This, I think, is what's important to human beings. This and, of course, education for their kids, which we are now struggling. Our current mayor struggles with the legacy of his father. And the legacy of his father is um, the assumption that public school education was not for their kids. Their kids went to Catholic schools, like I did. Um, in other words, other kids, immigrant kids, black kids, went to public schools, which is why they turned their backs on the system 40 years ago, which is why we have a system that people have been moving out of the city to avoid so that they can find their kids good schools for 30 some years. Okay, so we've got the heavy-handed uh, reorganization put, put in place by the current mayor, which unfortunately usurped some, some of the decentralization efforts that were started before that on local control of schools. A mixture, of course, is necessary. Um, but the main thing is that the results are we have fully, full human beings, full kids. Not just kids who can take tests, but kids who know without even being told by the news show at 6 o'clock that today is a day they should go next door to the old person who lives next door to them with their shovel and say, I'm going to shovel your walk. I don't expect money, but I expect you know, that you understand that this is out of a code of behavior and morality that is going to guide me the rest of my life. You know, not doing something for something except for the fullness of you to, to inhabit yourself. We don't encourage, not only do we not encourage our kids to inhabit themselves fully, because that scares grown-ups a lot, we don't encourage our citizens to inhabit themselves fully. What does it mean to inhabit oneself? It means you're more powerful than the, the power structures around you. Explain it. Well, we've seen how very few people can come together with an intent and change the world. We've seen it. And we see it over and over again. You know, I, in this neighborhood, I think it was in the early 60s, um, there, were, there was talk that they were going to continue that long road of, row of canyon effect, tall buildings right on the lakefront, casting its shadow on the poor slobs that live west of it, and taking away the lakefront. Um, we have like this gem of a park right here. It's called Loyola Park, which reflects institutional <laughs> bullydom. But anyway, it's, it runs from uh, North Shore Avenue to Tui Avenue, and it's gorgeous, and it's huge. And um, that, that stands in honor of about five women who decided, who heard, who understood the plans, what the plans were, and they were even starting the landfill south here. And they organized their community to send bags of sand to the mayor's office. Bags of sand from Loyola Beach, Farwell Beach, Tui Beach, and begging or whatever, demanding, do not cover this beach. It's not covered, and those women are the reason why. And that's only one just real close by example. How do you spend your time these days, Katie? And overall, how does that shape the way you think and feel about Chicago at this point in history? Well, right now I'm actually a graduate student, <laughs> which is very amazing and new. And I'm studying, what else? Chicago Studies at Loyola downtown. Um, this is yet another step in nothing I've plotted out. I just keep following my nose and my gut in this life. and my life comes to me. So currently 
I'm a, uh, the fellow at Chicago Studies, which means I'm, I'm going to help teach the class I'm taking in a couple of weeks. So that's very, very involving. I'm also still happily um, ensconced in the Heartland um, domain, <laughs> the Heartland world, which has um, been a real um, pleasure to be a part of from the beginning. And um, people say, when, how can you say that like you were, you know, I'm a founder of it with Michaels, but uh, um, it's bigger than us and it always was bigger than us even though it was our idea and we found it, you know, started building it. We, from the get-go, there were always more people involved with the idea, with accepting us in the neighborhood, with bringing us stuff, bringing their talents to bear on the project, on the enterprise, without ever, ever, it had anybody stopped to say, what am I going to get out of this monetarily? We wouldn't, have, we wouldn't be here. What is it? It's heart. It's soul. It's, it's, uh... It's uh, being invited to bring yourself fully. That's, that's what a Heartland is. That's why we've had 25 years of wonderful people working here. It's because somehow we sent out the message, you have something that we need. You have something to offer. And we want you to offer it. We don't want you to hold back. As far as I can tell, that is what is the unique experience over the years of Heartland employees. and and Heartland friends and uh, construction workers and everybody who's helped us in so many ways, Heartland customers even, um, definitely. Uh, there is a sense that they are welcome in their whole, in whatever their package is, that, that they, uh, they can be that here. Um, there's a service place up the street that um, serves uh, the a kind of a community of adults in transition who cannot fully live on their own without some medication or some financial help. So they, they do both of those things. They have little job training things and they have, and they have a clinic uh, that uh, passes out medication. These folks had run into not huge acceptance once the building first became occupied by this group. They, they'd get kicked out of coffee shops because they just sit and drink coffee for a long time. And use lots of sugar. <laughs> Tons of sugar. Anyway, because they um, found the Heartland after a while, um, and we didn't kick them out, and we'd, we'd refill their coffee cup, and we allowed them to smoke in one section of the place, um, we developed a relationship with the people who took care of them. And that relationship, those people are so good that they are letting us use their parking lot when the office is closed, which makes a huge difference in this neighborhood to, as a business to uh, offer people parking. And as a result of that arrangement, we feed their staff at their quarterly staff meetings. They come in and they take over the restaurant for the afternoon. They have a meeting, they eat, and I like that. I like it's barter, first of all. It's based on goodwill. It's based on what works for everybody. And adjustments have to be made, which, which also involves communication and responsibility to one another. You know, it's, it makes it harder and harder. Every time you develop relationships like that and, and build on them, it makes it harder and harder to actually like stand back, pretend like you don't see or you're not connected to the fellow human beings around you. What are the impediments to creating those kinds of relationships around the city for people who have ideas and would like to create those kinds of relationships, but at the same time don't have a cafe to uh, create that kind of, you know, that don't have that as to offer, and at the same time don't have this base in both a history of organizing and bringing people together, and at the same time knowing that those are things they want, whether you run a dry cleaner or you run a office building or whatever. Right. I think the only impediment to it, really, the biggest impediment is in here, in, you know, that you don't believe, you really don't believe you can do it, and you haven't had support to, you know, you, I think everybody needs someone telling them, and, or a series of someones in their lives being dreamers, you know, imagining things together. And sooner or later, if you make that a habit, you're going to run into either one or a number of dreamers who says together all at the same time, 
well then let's do this. And then you do it. And then you start seeing that you can create your world. I mean, I, I do think that's what the Heartland has been, for, in my estimation. It's been, it came from Michael and I saying, okay, what's missing? What's missing is a place where you can get brown rice and beans at a reasonable price. You can also still smoke a cigarette at some part of the restaurant. And it's a place that is completely abuzz with what's important to us as, as uh, activists. Um, environmental issues for this, the world in large and the city in general, city in particular, um, neighborhood concerns, organizing concerns, political uh, uh, debate, you know, if, I mean if this country had to political debate, we might have had a we might have had an election that said something this time. What did and, the election say? Well, it actually did. Yeah, it said a lot. Uh, it said, you know, uh, it said so much, actually. First of all, it said that only half of the people voted. Only half of the uh, adult age voting possible adults in this country took part in these, this election. I mean, in all of the in all of the commentary, et cetera, in the five weeks in between electing and getting a president, no one really, I mean, except for Doris Kearns Goodwin on Channel 11, no one really uh, emphasized the fact that only 50% of the people voted. Had 60% of the people voted, we, we, they would have called it a mandate for one of these slobs. <laughs> you know? The other thing that the election should be teaching some Democrats is it's really, really not useful to eat your young, okay? As in the way they talked about Nader. Instead of allowing him into the contest, instead of debating him, they, first of all, they look chicken shit when they say, oh, no, 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 you can't get in the debate. Oh, no, no, no. We can't handle real ideas from a person who clearly is not going to win, but because of that has the freedom to speak the truth? What is this? And I think American people see that. And it, it, it lessens the candidates who spend, expend energy and time and money keeping Nader out of the debate or trying to keep him off the ballot. And in Chicago, we know who expended that energy, and it wasn't George W. Um, it makes you less than. So instead of saying, the third party candidate who never had a chance in hell to win anyway, wasn't going for that, is what beat us. You beat yourselves. You lost the election. Snap out of it. Stand up. Go away. Take your losses like a big person and regroup. So what do progressive political activists in Chicago take away from this experience in terms of what they now bring to the table for the future in this city? Well. And progressive political activists in Chicago already know if, if they are still progressive and activists in Chicago, they know a lot already. They know a lot. They've been up against, you know, a pretty um, mammoth uh, machine for uh, a long time. So if they are actually progressive and political and active right now, first of all, they are a very small number, unfortunately. And they occasionally have to get off the, the soapbox in order to make a living. Although some people manage to do both at the same time, and I recommend that. Um, what we should do is, is more of what we have done and new things all the time. Um, there's always a new generation to reach out to. And one thing that Nader did was he reached out to and got the new generation. He, half, a third of the people who voted for him, I would say, across the country wouldn't have voted if he wasn't a choice, off, uh, offered them. That's a huge enfranchisement. Um, would that the regular parties knew how to do that? Every once in a while they do. I think when Bill Clinton first ran, he actually got a big youth vote activated, big in quotes. Um, I think political activists in Chicago have to continue to focus on our political process in this city, which is particularly and uniquely connected to the government process. And not particular, not always in bad ways, but certainly not always in ways that serve the public. Explain what you mean in general. Well, I mean we elect a, we elect a representative from each ward. Whether or not he or she has anything to do with actually governing this city is um, is a is anybody's guess. First of all, 
and it's uh, there's a remote, remote possibility that they will. They do not. They do not write legislation. They generally just pass ordinances in, that the that the administration puts together. Even if the administration is actually rewording something that a progressive may have, may have stood up and tried to pass under his or her own steam, generally, if there is some kind of groundswell that supports that idea, they'll table. This is an old hat pattern of Chicago City Council. I mean, Chicago's mayors. They'll table that guy's stuff, and it'll reappear, written by Ed Burke or some other connected hack. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, you know, the mayor gets credit for it. So it's city, uh, Chicago residents should push their council members to be, to be something less, something more than gutless wonders. I mean, rubber stamp council or gray wolves should not be our true choices. We should have activism, and, and we should be, um, and they should be proud of the way they do act, their activism, as opposed to standing up and calling each other out for a duel, which is what happens, you know, when there is, we, we, we go from one extreme to the other. We go from rubber stamp to council wars back to rubber stamp. I'm sorry, this is not really, uh, we don't deserve this. Well, if we don't deserve it, we have to prove it. That's my, my point, and I have it, you know, we have a sign in the bar, I think, says, if you don't vote, you can't bitch. Well, I don't exactly believe that. I think you can bitch any time. But I really do think if you're not registered to vote, first of all, you're a numbskull. You know, if you, if you choose when election time comes around that there's no one there for you to vote for, that's fine. But if you're not registered to vote, that means you're not even planning on having that uh, possibility. And I think that's lame. I mean, I, I, and I will criticize the republic with any, along with anyone. It's eminently criticizable, but, you know, it's pretty easy to criticize if you sit around just, uh, you know, gazing at MTV and, you know, going to your $300,000 townhome and, and closing your door on the world. I, I think that the challenge for all of us is to get involved in our lives, and by that it means get out of our minds, you know, to get out there, do something, extend ourselves. Um, because it's really actually a selfish action when it comes down to it. You get so much more back than you ever give. You start giving, you know, offering something out, it comes back to you ten times. It's incredible. Tell me about where you began earlier saying about the larger forces, a wave that's taking over the city right now. How do you define that wave, and well, why is it happening right now? Well, I don't want to give too much credit to something that I sort of am spooked by, actually, but um, it does seem to be the dominant force that's outwardly appearing. The dominant force is this um, developer-driven, real estate market-driven uh, move to fill in every empty square footage, at least on the north side, and we'll get to why it's different. On the north side, with these fairly ugly, by the way, um, flat-faced, you know, tall townhome condo things, engineered specifically to get make the most dollar amount for the guys that are developing and building it, and, and for the people selling it. And there, there is nothing even remotely about either the design or the appeal to the buyer that is talking about building community, ensuring community, um, reinforcing community. They are th again, they are designed to be things that you can physically enter without ever actually seeing day or night or being seen. This is, this is negative planning, you know? We should be planning around the commons a little more. Um, we, even though we have lots of parks in Chicago, per capita, our acreage, our park acreage is very low. Um, and compared to cities around the country, I, I forget, you probably have, know this quicker than me right now, but maybe we're 
17th or 20th or something in large cities per capita human being park acreage which surprised the heck out of me because I thought with our beautiful lakefront and you know Douglas Park and Washington Park, all these but we don't have it so we should not be filling up all these empty and if we're filling up empty spaces and our city leadership was what it should be they'd be pointing the developers on onto the south side and west side and say fill in some blanks there guys and girls and until you do we got a density limit in the rest of these places and until you do that we've got a limit on how many cars we're going to allow to live in a neighborhood you know I, resident sticker parking is completely anti the commons what is this the street is public since when do I have to have an identity card to park my car on a street? Okay, what was the question? <laughs> I've I heard forget. a lot about the mantra, or I've heard many people throw around the idea of development without displacement. What does that mean? What kind of development would you like to see, in a, and in what sort of face would it have that you think would be more in well, favor of the community? I guess the easiest thing, can I just call somebody to call? Sure. Or, yo, Leona. Por favor. Yuck. Cold stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Quieres más? You guys need cream? Not me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Well, I think that development that that starts with a community process has a better chance of coming close to development without displacement. At the same token, I, d I don't think there's a pat answer at all, I, and I don't promote blanket pat answers. There are people who wanted to leave Cabrini Green. There are people who want to leave uh, Robert Taylor Holmes, <laughs> who wouldn't want to leave certain of those. But when and and those buildings again that's dealing with the legacy of, of a racist policy it was containment and geographic um, densification so that uh, uh, what was perceived of as the only possible way to deal with uh, a burgeoning black population was to warehouse them in these things um, you know it's we should learn from how quickly that turned around in our lifetimes I saw those things being built. I am watching them being torn down. And in this community, a very different population, different issues, what would the development look like that would not displace and that would at the same time you know, acknowledge what the community would like to see change, the resources, and whether it's from the city or locally, going to create what? Well, uh, for example, we have a thing going in over here on Sheridan Road at the curve going into Evanston that I think is way over dense, way unnecessary, and it was it should have been a park. And it's like, I don't know, something like 50 units going in where there used to be one gas station on a curve in the road right over the lake. Now, I, it just once, just once I'd like to see development that does not um, bow to the almighty dollar, you know, I know that's a ridiculous concept, but that is the concept. And in this neighborhood, because we are lucky enough to have lakefront property, we should totally guard it from that, and we should guard it from um, the, uh, you know, physical uh, derision. I mean, uh, denigration, the water quality. It's, we should be more involved in that. And some of us in the local advisory council on the at the park. Park Advisory Council are developing a, a notion of how to have some, you know, community um, um, input to uh, a variety of bodies about the water quality and to get information from the park district, which is very difficult. Um, okay, so community um, development would look like a long, arduous, democratic process. It's sloppy. It doesn't fit in the the mold of, of corporate, get it done, you know. Sit down at the table, draw it out, boom, it's done. And that's how, how we wind up with, you know, that's the struggle we're at right now, is to humanize and communityize the process of 
building, rebuilding um, community that is already here. I mean, we're all concrete here. So, and most of the lots are filled. And a few, uh, you know, forward-thinking people a few years back guarded little plots of land, right, like that little corner play lot over there, Goldberg play lot over there, from that turning into a, yet another building. We're pretty densely packed here. A good thing is is when people come together to create murals on the on the uh, L walls. A good thing is when people come together to plant plant uh, a, a garden together, as there is up on Birchwood and around there. Um, I think there is some good development happening in this neighborhood. I think that um, there are always forces uh, at war with each other about stuff, but I don't mind conflict as long as we're not using bats and chains, much less guns, etc. Conflict is okay. Does it surprise you that there isn't a more militant or violent struggle or revolution going on in our country? Or no, in, in it doesn't city? surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. It's really a no-win situation. They've got all the guns. Who's they? Well, whoever you'd be revolting against, is they're the armed ones. I mean, I think we, I considered it 20-some <laughs> years ago. I looked around and said, this is dumb. If I really push it, I'm going to be dead or in jail. And then that would make me useless to the struggle. I mean, not, there are some very useful prisoners, but they'd rather not be prisoners, like Leonard Paltier. Um, what do people need to know about the city, the city at this point in history, about where they are, both the challenges, the strengths and the weaknesses of where the this 10 million people find themselves? Bottom line, I think people need to know that their neighbors are good. They're good and they're smart. And that um, and that's all that they really need to look to uh, for, for creating a real human space in their lives in this city. It's to look to the human beings on a ground level that are around them. Um, and that and that there are a good number of people in all fields in this city that have the commons in their minds, you know, the taking care of the commons, whether it's the air and water or the, the free space and the good space in the city, in their neighborhoods. I think the fact that we are a city of neighborhoods is one of our strongest um, pluses, our strongest gifts, um, because you say 10 million, and of course I think of the city, which is 3 million, and, um, and I think of my own community, which is about 50,000. That's a lot of people to deal with just by itself, so it's nice to have the first bite you take out of your place in the city be a smaller bite and a, be a neighborhood bite, and I think that's what sitting on this corner being a business for 25 years has allowed us to to really impact first of all our right surrounding community and people here know that we have and they are the ones who taught me to continually teach me how we do um, impact them um, and then from there you have a base from which to be comfortable to go forward if you don't connect in some rooted way right where you are, um, I think you're not as stable going out. When I go to other places in the world, much less in the country, I, I, am, I am always thinking of Chicago. And I'm always, I, get, I wind up climbing mountains in Colorado with a bunch of strangers and they, they're calling me Chicago at the end of the week or two weeks because that's, I'm wearing Heartland all over my chest, and I'm talking about the city, and I'm uh, I'm very rooted here. I'm very uh, identified here. What kind of ideas? You just touched on it a bit, but what kind of ideas do you have for people who are trying to create both? You know, you take you run a business here, and at the same time, your business it is runs me. Into, <laughs> this business that runs in you. What ideas do you have? Whether it's young people trying to mix 
activism with the artwork they do or in starting a business or right. people who own existing businesses, whether they're new or their families, whether they're new restaurants that serve sushi in a hip area right. or their old school family businesses. Ideas about making a business into a more communal approach to playing a role in a neighborhood or in a city uh, and cultivating relationships with those around them beyond uh, just the products that or services those people consume. Right. <coughs> well, I think that they just should love their they should love their project. They should love it into being and love it into opening every day and um, and see what that brings. I mean just pour it on and it and it'll it'll continually feed your imagination as to where to go next. I think first of all, it is so unique um, to have a from the ground run mom pa style business anymore that just by doing that alone you've invited a very very uh, direct contact with yourself via your business the city the neighborhood you're in the city beyond that um, <laughs> the governing bodies who license you and tax you etc um, it's very unique and in the 25 years we've had the heartland Unfortunately, many, many, many small businesses have closed, and we've got the the um, uh, specter of you know, Starbucks and White Hen pantries, etc. And what about people who run those places? Well, you know, I've dealt with that, and I find that, for example, Starbucks just came to Rogers Park not long ago, and the people who work there, at least the people who started working there don't live in the neighborhood. So they don't really have a sense of, you know, in fact, they come into the neighborhood to work there. I, I actually had this conversation with a kid who worked there. He thinks it's a dangerous neighbor. He thinks he works in a dangerous neighborhood. Um, so when you run a business, you want to hire people who live right around you. First of all, they don't have to drive. You know, over the 25 years we've been here, I would say 90% of the people who worked here walked here, rode their bike, or took the L. Um, more of our employees now do have cars, but they don't drive them here if they if they can get away with it. Um, I try and make as many aspects of your project feed your vision of a better world. We we have always recycled, even before the city, quote unquote, began recycling. And the city is terrible at recycling. I want to say that, and that should be something that, I mean, if there's an environmentalist, if there's someone in this administration who calls themselves an environmentalist, they damn well better be figuring out a way to get us off this BS blue bag stuff. And uh, anyway, so make more every, as many aspects of your business, whether it's from painting the signs to throwing out the trash and not throwing out anything but trash um, reflect the vision of your bigger picture. So you, you, one of the things I encourage students all the time when I, I was teaching, picture the world you want. Voice it. Draw pictures with your friends. What would it look like? Would it look like multiracial? Say it. Would it look many ages? Would it have ramps for the handicap? Say it. Say it again and again. Draw pictures. Write essays. Study the writings and drawings and picturings of other dreamers and idealistic folk. Study our own history and how people out of nothing created incredible projects. Jane Addams and Hull House which still exists today. If people would read that story, if, if they would teach that story in Chicago schools, like they used to teach us civics. And when I was growing up, we had a little blue civics book. My, my, one of my goals is to bring back civics in grammar school level. And uh, Give me just a short idea of what that would look like. Oh, it could be. It's, it's, uh, it's everything from experiential education to um, plain, flat out, this is what the government is, this is what it looks like, this is how you have access to it, period. And the, which is the typical civics, uh, um, uh, you know. Model? No, I mean uh, curriculum, uh, pedagogy. 
but the, we haven't had it. We haven't had it in this city for a long time, in part, and I think it's fed separation. And it's fed, uh, it's fed uh, lack of people's uh, development, their intuition about how, the, how to live in a democratic system. We, we all felt empowered, in, you know, when we were growing up. And then the Vietnam War happened and, and race separation and all this other stuff. And uh, those, those things are not going to be complete until people are empowered out the other end. And I, I think that's what right now is about, is uh, understanding that the 60s was this little moment, along with many moments, and, it's, and we're still here. It's still going on. Was that okay? Yeah. It just happened? Okay. Well, uh, if, what, are, what would you say is most important to you in your own life and your ideas about what your dream is, both for your business and or the city and or what you'd like to see in our world? Okay, that's really small. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right here. You talk I, a think lot what's about what mo I think what's create. most important is um, honesty. Um, ever, ever more trying to be more genuine. Um, I think what's really, really important to me right now is uh, to uh, feed uh, some inner meditative center core that I, so that I can, so that I am more practiced at, at being with that place every day, whether I'm sitting alone in my apartment looking at the lake or sitting on the L surrounded by the myriad of residents that live in this city to access that quiet, powerful place in the middle of me that would encourage others to do the same. Um, I'm very, I've been very good at being out there active and I, I encourage others and I think the other half of that is um, a more meditative art that we all have. Um, it's very important to me that the Heartland uh, survive. Um, so that's one, on a very personal level, I want this place to uh, survive and flourish and be, be here for other generations. Um, it's very important to me that my neighborhood maintain the wonderful uh, global flavor that it has right now with Africans, Mexican, Latin American, uh, Polish, Bosnian, all of us variety of mutts that we are that call ourselves American, Italians, Irish American, etc., etc. I I want this neighborhood to uh, maintain that that mixture and uh, and also an economic diversity in some way that that is actually more uh, conscious of itself beyond just us practiced conscious people. I want everybody to share some kind of value in that. And also I would like for everybody to value our, uh, our commons more and take more ownership of it, active ownership of it. I want, I want me not to be the only person I see telling people, hey, pick up your dog shit there. <laughs> Put that away, because it's, I mean, it's a biohazard and we got kids running around in the park. We have a lot of very responsible dog people in, in uh, our park up here, but you know, we need always to be teaching people how to do that better, and teaching ourselves. Um, I'd like us to be progressive in, in ways that aren't necessarily social and political. I'd like us to be a little more scientific as a populace and know more about what is it that's falling right now out of the sky. Is that just snow, or is that ash, too? And is, you know, what's in that? I want us to know that stuff, and I want us to be, everybody to be conversant with it. I don't assume that experts are the only ones who should know about this. In fact, from my experience, it hasn't served us to only have experts conversant with this stuff. So I'd like us all to get a little more technical in our knowledge, and clearly we can, since kids can operate computers the way that they've learned how to in just the last decade or so, I think anything's possible. That's probably a good place to end. Who are you and where are we? Who am I? Oh, I'm Katie Hogan.
We're at the Heartland Cafe, center of the universe. <laughs> I like the music we ended on too.